Nine hours, seven goals, four wide open conference semifinal series, and more cups of coffee than I care to count. We have finished day one of the conference semi. Smile, folks. Be excited. It was a good day of soccer. I had a great time. We got to get the energy up because everybody's here with us trying to wrap up a day. Megan Klinkenberg, winner of things as I said, Kalen Carr. Matt Doyle, Bobby Warshaw to join us in one second. We're wrapping up all the action tonight. Eastern Conference, Western Conference, everything to play for over the next week. All right, deep breath. Let's dig in. Let's get to it. Megan, what did you see tonight that you liked? What do you see tonight that uh, matters? Well, honestly, all of the games were close. It was uh, fun to watch every, well, mostly fun to watch every <laughs> match. Uh, but what I like about this is that every team's still in it. Not one team is completely out of it uh, at this stage, and that sets up for really great next round. Thursday, Cascadia, Seattle, Portland, going back to CenturyLink Field. They're all alone on that day, and then we'll come back here on Sunday and wrap it up with three more series. We've got the times coming for you in just a second, so you can plan. Kalen Carr, in your words, RSL only score bangers, while Diego Rubio <laughs> only scores off the bench. What did you see today? Well, the, the big one I'm focusing on was Atlanta winning a street fight. I mean, I went up to Yankee yeah. Stadium and look, I'd seen some physical matches. I thought I had played in a couple leading up to this one, <laughs> but this was unlike anything I'd seen in quite some time in MLS, especially compared to some of the beautiful football that, you know, Columbus at times played tonight or, or the beautiful goal that we saw from Salt Lake. Atlanta United proved a lot to me as far as their toughness. Tata Martino pulled all the right strings with his substitutions and his game plan. And, and look, they just showed their toughness. They, they hadn't shown up in weeks past. We wondered which Atlanta was going to be there. Big questions answered today, and they're in their driver's seat now. Final numbers came in on that game. There were 753 fouls. <laughs> it felt like it. For real. <laughs> Zero persistent infringement yellows. <laughs> Triple digits. Julie Stewart Binks was at Yankee Stadium for us. We got some interviews coming for her in just a little bit. David Goss was in Portland. Julian Sakovitz in Columbus. Susanna Collins at the riot. We have got so much coverage coming for you. Interviews, analysis, everything else. Matt, give me your take. I mean, I, I think Megan kind of hit the nail on the head. Nobody's out of it. I, I like that these first legs were uh, mostly exciting. I think eight halves of soccer, six of them were pretty good. Um, it was a better first round of the conference semifinals than last year, and I don't think anybody's any happier than uh, the people in Columbus right now. Given all they've been through this year and given the way their team came out and played, especially in that second half today, a huge win for them, been a huge month for them. Uh, super happy for them. All right, we're getting to Bobby Doyle, or excuse me, Bobby but, Warshaw in oh, a second. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's past midnight right now. We're rolling on. Let's see the action, the highlights. That is what you are here for. Four games, the first leg of the conference semis. And Doyle, we start in Columbus, Jossie Zardes. Yeah, well, more like Pipe Higuain, huh? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole combination play, just like slicing through the Red Bulls, high pressure, and finishing that off. And then, um, you know, you have a match winner on one end, and then you have a match winner on the other end. That is ridiculous from Zach Steffen. No doubt about it. NYCFC did not win at home. That doesn't happen often. Eric Rometty. That goal, pretty. that goal seemed to sum up the match for me. <laughs> it was a, a little bit of, bit of just picking up the scraps. And, and credit to Remedi, I thought he was good all game uh, and, and follows up his chance well. This one, what do you think, Weeby? High, high boot? Oh, man. Initially, I said, no, don't take that goal away. But I think uh, you have to tune into instant replay for the rest of it. Seattle, they got the early goal. But then it was Portland, Megan, came back. 2-1 winners. Yeah, Portland was absolutely lethal on the counter today. They had some really incredible uh, just individual plays and here's another one from from Blanco and you saw earlier from Ibo BC and it's just it was amazing to watch yeah. today some of you the know what amazing? Yeah. Uh, 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 that RSL wow that goal right up there Bobby this is not good from Nick Romando yeah none of everyone on this team to make a mistake for it to be Nick Romando it's so surprising SKC kind of stole the, the draw in this one to give themselves a chance back at home yeah huge away goal for Peter Ramis's team these were the results. Columbus at home, 1-0 winners. New York Rebels have some work to do going back to Red Bull Arena. Portland, 2-1 at home. Seattle got that all-important away goal, but they got some injury issues. We'll get into that a little bit. NYCFC, only one team's won at Yankee Stadium this year. That was the Revs. Atlanta get a big win. Real Salt Lake, 1-1. Sporting Kansas City, the nightcap. We saw seven goals on this day. We will give you our favorites in just a second. But we want to know who made the biggest impact in lag one, basically, Who's your MVP of the night? You got Iguain, Pipa, Ibobise. Nice goal on the break for him. Rometty bundled it home, and then Rusnak 
had a beautiful strike, but he will not play in the second leg. Who are you taking, Doyle? Uh, I'm taking Ibobasi. His ability uh, to sort of complete that Portland attack, which had been lacking the second half of the season, he has solidified his spot as a starter in two games now in the playoffs. He has a primary assist, a goal, and it was him who forced Ozzy Alonso into that turnover that led to the game winner today. Doyle, it's Higuain, and, and it's not even close. He's been the player. Wow. He's been the player of the tur- <laughs> of, of the playoffs so far. If yeah. you look at that first leg going away, the mere Crylock would like that. a word with you. <laughs> well, they may not be around too long. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I, I think Kansas City's looking good, but Higuain, he's been the story, the MVP of the playoffs so far. Take anybody else? What do you Sorry, think? Doyle, I'm I'm have to go with Kaylin here. Higuain, I mean, he only played a half. And he came on, and he was the difference maker. He, I mean, he didn't have as much as many touches as everybody else, but he made those touches count. And to me, MVP so far. Get on Twitter. Make your hurt voice heard. Go vote. Here's the bracket right now in the Western Conference. Sporting KC RSL, all even. One goal apiece. Sporting KC with that away goal. Nil-nil in Kansas City, and they are moving on. Portland, 2-1. That's going to be wild on Thursday night. It's going to be absolutely crazy. But these are the highlights. From the late game, RSL won. Sporting Kansas City won. Albert Rusnak does not like that. It means he will miss the next match, that yellow card. I can't get over Are this you, what? goal. What? I can't what? get over this goal. That cushion had her what? If this is if this is Suarez and, and Messi, it, it's, it's getting, you know, three million views on, on on Twitter and every other platform. What a goal. Hey, the, the last goal from uh, Salt Lake got a bunch of views. I saw last week. That's so. true. Can I give know. you some stats here on Diego Rubio? This is, by the way, his first touches of the match after coming off the bench. Just 50 seconds in. The man hasn't scored since September 1st. He's got five off the bench. What a huge save from Nick Armando, making up for what was a, a – it was an error. It was a gap. It was big, and, and, I, and I think it will prove costly. I, I think this will uh, be the undoing of Real Salt Lake. The margins in the playoffs, especially for a team like Salt Lake that, that just doesn't have maybe the firepower that other teams do, I, I think this will prove costly because, look, you know, now Salt Lake, I mean, uh, Sporting only needs a draw. 0-0 at home gets them through. They had a terrible game today. I felt like they couldn't keep the ball. Their possession numbers were, I think, in the 30s, which is rare for this team. And, and they just couldn't get anything going. And, and so... I think Salt Lake was actually poised for a good result. They had the beautiful goal, and they were in position to potentially either get out there at one nil or at potentially try and get a second. And now they look at it, and it's, I think it's going to be too late for them. I think this was a big missed opportunity and an opportunity that you just, you just can't make these. Yeah. The margins are too small for the team, and there's no uh, Rusnak in the next round as well, yeah. who's been their, uh, one of their main playmakers. They did it at LAFC at Sporting Kansas City equally hard, and now they've got that away goal to contend with. You mentioned the possession numbers. Ben, the research bear, the king of takes, as you know, I'm from Extra Time Radio, broke this down for us. Sporting Kansas City's 33.41% possession is their lowest in a match since August 2015, and yet it didn't really matter, Megan. When you see this number, what do you think? I mean, that sounds like they're just playing kickball the whole time, and that's not their style. That's not the way that they play. But you have to give a credit to them. With these numbers, they were still able to battle back and get that crucial away goal. Sign of a veteran team. Yeah. You know, this is it, the core of this team has been together for a long time, and they've added some pieces here and subtracted some pieces there. But when the going got tough, and this is a cliche, but when the going got tough, like they reverted to form, which is they pressed mm-hmm. and they relied on their defense to create their offense. And, that got them the goal that, I mean, I'm with Kalen. It's hard to see a path for RSL now. All right, we've got Mike Pecky live right now at the podium. Let's join that. Found Albert a bit more. We found Sonny that took a higher position, which we talked about at halftime, a lot more to turn and go. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it, like I said, it, it's halftime. It's halftime right now, and we have a, a seven-day halftime, which is, which is pretty cool. What allowed you to find Albert more in the second half and, and get more chances in that second quarter? Like I said, it was better off ball movement. It was quicker passes. <clears throat> you know, if you in the first half, there was a lot of, you know, uh, this guy to the guy right next to him, to the guy right next to him, to the guy right next to him, which was slow. Allows them to shift and allows them to clog st- stuff up very easily. I think we um, we bypassed players a bit more in the second half. The ball movement was quicker, um, and the off ball movement was quicker, which allowed us to find gaps. Um, which again is not easy against a team like uh, Kansas City because they're extremely organized. So, like I said, the first half was a bit heavy legs, and whatever other reasons, uh, the second half we came out with a bit more energy, which allowed us to move better off the ball and, and find those gaps.
it appeared to me that even in the first half, maybe Nick Ramondo's clearances were a little bit slower. Do you think that played into it all? <clears throat> the one that they deflected, obviously, was he? I mean, you said they were maybe slow. Could he have been a little bit slow on no, his clearances? No, I think Nicky. No, I, absolutely not. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't think Nicky's um, clearances or distribution was slow. I think what Nick was doing, because he's a seasoned veteran, is he knows he could wait that extra second. If something opens up, he's able to adjust quickly and, and play that ball. So he's able to delay a little bit to, to make a clearance. Um, not a little. I, I don't think the ball that Nicky um, got blocked should have came back to Nicky. Again, it goes back to how many balls were played back to Nick tonight. Um, I, I think there were better options than to play back to him. Um, it was. It is what it is. You know, they got their away goal. Uh, it's tied one-one, and now we have a job to do in, in Kansas City. Speaking of Kansas City, what do you need to correct in order to get the result that you want on the road? Um, correct is not the right word. Um, it's going to be a completely different game. It's going to be a, a, on the road in Kansas City, a place that we got a result earlier this year. Um, but it's obviously going to be against a team that's going to play a bit differently. The only thing that's not going to change is their organization by tonight, but I think they're going to be a heck of a lot more aggressive going forward. Um, and we've dealt with that this year many times. Uh, many times we weren't successful. Many times, like the most recent um, four days ago, we were, we were successful. Uh, as long as that we are organized, uh, that's the first part of it, organization and, and not giving anything away. Um, and we're going to work, obviously, on being a heck of a lot more explosive in transition, um, a heck of a lot more uh, mobile and, and quicker in the off-ball movement to create gaps and to turn face forward and put them a bit in their half. Uh, but again, we have, we have six and a half days, and it's a, it's, a, it's a tough task, you know, going into a place like that against a team like this. So, uh, but the good thing is, I'll say it for the 15th time already, is that we have six and a half days now to, to look at it, to figure it out, and, and to uh, make adjustments. Six and a half days to figure this out. Six and a half days to shop for a uh, brand spanking new sweater for Mike Pecky, <laughs> Sporting Kansas City. The man knows the sweater. Albert Rusnak, they will not have him. That is a huge blow. The number 10, a massive part of their season, their success. He got a second yellow card. He was not happy about it. He also got that beautiful goal. Kalen, what happens without him? What do they lose? Well, they, they lose a goal scorer, uh, number one. But I, you know, I, keep, I don't mean to harp on it, but I, I can't, go, can't say enough what a missed opportunity this was. But, you know, they have Johan Croze is playing left back for this team for yeah. Sporting Kansas City, and they've got Jefferson Savarino playing right wing, who's one of the most talented wingers in the league. I, th I think, look, if there's one thing that they need to add, he talked about being a little bit more dynamic in the attack. Uh, I think Corey Baird has to come in and play in this next match. Plata w was okay today, but when they were successful against LAFC and even in the last few weeks of this season, Corey Baird has been a part of that. A and his movement, uh, his dynamic ability and attack adds something different. And look, you know, at this point, you kind of got to roll the dice. And, and I, I think you playing a young rookie who's going to be hungry putting in this match, I think that would be a move that they can pull in to try and account for the loss of Rusnak. But you're missing that. I mean, that, that's what you're missing. <laughs> I mean, it, Baird extends the game vertically. He, he, he makes the you know he makes the game big for the rest of those guys, and um, they didn't really have that tonight. And I think that's why they were a little bit slow in transition. Plata comes back to the ball. Rusnak comes back back to the ball. Uh, Severino comes back to the ball. Krylock tries to stretch the field, but he's he's not that guy. And without Baird, they didn't have that, which is why even though they had so much of the ball, they didn't create a ton of really good chances. Um, it's a different game in Kansas City, though. You know you're not going to have 65% of the ball. Yeah. So I think just getting Barrett out there, um, I don't know whether it's as a forward or you play him underneath Crylock. I mean, I, I kind of don't want to move Crylock out of that number nine spot because he's been so good. Um, but we've seen Mike Pecky do interesting stuff this year. Uh, it's going to be interesting again six and a half days from now. So the question is, what does the man himself think about this? Albert Rusnak will not play in the second leg. That is where he wants to be. Susanna Collins caught up with him after this match. Albert, you guys get the 1-1 draw here at home, coming off that emotional victory against LAFC. How do you feel your, your team performed here tonight? Um, I mean, it's a disappointing result, 1-1. You know, we would have been uh, better off with a 1-0 win, and um, I thought it was a poor goal to concede out of all the chances they had. 
Um, yeah, it doesn't put us in the best situation for the for the second leg, but uh, we won at LAFC, so I don't see why we couldn't beat Kansas City at that place. You scored an absolute banger of a goal out there. Take us through that. How did that build up? Yeah, I mean, I scored a couple of volleys this year already, so uh, no, it was a great setup from Damir, you know, and uh, when I'm in front of the box, I don't try and take another touch. I try to uh, shoot one touch, hit it on goal, and uh, I'm glad it went in. Well, we've seen that you guys can win on the road. You mentioned LAFC. How do you get it done at Children's Mercy Park on Sunday? Same way we got it done at LAFC, you know. We have to be compact. Uh, we have to be solid defensively. And uh, as I said this season many times, you know, we're a team who scores, uh, scores a lot of goals. So, uh, I mean, we're going to have to score at least, uh, at least a goal to go through. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, we have to repeat, try and repeat the performance with the LAFC. Got to repeat that performance they had against LAFC. It's going to be a tough one for Albert Rusnak and RSL, number one, because Albert Rusnak will not be there. We'll see what they do. Mike Pecky has some work to do in the next six and a half days. Let's switch over to Sporting Kansas City's side. It looked for a long time, Megan, like this was a game that they were going to regret, and then Diego Rubio saves them in a way. What did you see from them that can translate to next week in Kansas City? Yeah, a credit to them for getting back in this, this matchup, but all they have to do is – get back to basics. They just need to play their style, relax into the game, and they just need to do what they're good at. If they play up to their potential, if they play up uh, to, to what they know they're capable of, then they should be the better team in this next game. And so I'm looking forward to them just getting back to basics, doing what they need to do, imposing their will and their style on the game, instead of, instead of letting RSL do that. 38 seconds later. That's incredible, Bobby. I think you nailed it talking about imposing your style because RSL are largely a street balling team. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means they kind of go out and just ball out in the game. Whereas SKC are really methodical. They're a system-oriented team, and it felt like SKC fell into the street game. They saw RSL trying to make these passes, trying to make these movements, and instead of doing the patterns they've done all year, they tried to do what RSL was doing. It just didn't work for them. Attacking-wise, what did you guys see? Diego Rubio comes and gets the goal. That's his fifth off the bench this year. That's what he does. But they didn't create the chances we've become accustomed to seeing from Shalwi, from Johnny Russell, from Kyrie Shelton. Not necessarily as a goal scorer, but as a facilitator, Doyle. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought Shelton was going to drag this back line out of shape all night, given the way he's played this year. Um, but RSL was really pretty disciplined at the back. And because of that, there weren't the usual type of gaps that we see the you know, Shalloway or, or Russell hitting, and then there wasn't enough creativity from midfield. But again, that's what makes Sporting Kansas City special is that when that's not working, they can still press you into, you know, coughing the ball up and, and turn that into a goal. All right, let's hear what Johnny Russell had to say. After this match, he, he caught up with Susanna at Rio Tinto. All right, Johnny, a 1-1 draw. You get the all-important goal on the road. All in all, how happy are you with your team's performance tonight? Um, yeah, we're happy. Uh, obviously, it'd be it'd be ideal if we could come here and get the three points. But you know, we played against a good side, and you know how much we knew how much quality they possessed, and you know how difficult a game it was going to be. So, you know, I think to come away with a with a point, it was you know it was a hard fought game, um, especially for us away from home. And you know, it's a could be a massive goal for us. So, you know, we take it into the the home leg now, and hopefully, we can capitalize on that. Diego Rubio comes off the bench, scores a huge goal for you guys. What does it say about the depth of this team? I spoke about that before. Um, you know, the quality we've got in pretty much every position. Um, so it doesn't matter who's playing or who steps in. Um, you know, they don't, they don't let the team down in any way. And, you know, when you've got guys like Diego who can come on, who's been, you know, he's been brilliant for us all season when he's, when he's played. And, you know, for him to come on and get the, the, the equaliser for us, and, you know, it's a, it's a massive goal. We saw some of the firepower that RSL is capable of tonight. You're going back to Children's Mercy Park. How do you keep that at bay? Um, we, need to, we need to do what we've done uh, tonight. We need to work hard. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a moment of quality, their goal. Uh, and we know he possesses that, and there's a lot of guys in their team that possess that. So you know, we, need to, we need to be mindful of that. But you know, we're going back to our place now, and it's time for us to you know, implement our game and you know, go and attack. All right, Bobby. 
Help us out here. 1-1 one, one after leg one, what's that mean for leg two? Advantage who? Yeah, this one's fairly simple. It'll be advantage SKC because they got the away goal, and at this point, if they go home and get a win, they're through. Obviously, on the flip side of that, if RSL win, they're through too after the draw in the first game. If RSL don't score, they are basically out of it because they wouldn't have an away goal. They wouldn't get the win. So 0-0 zero, zero, SKC through, 1-1 one, one extra time. Anything else, whoever wins is in, guys. All right, we'll talk more about this game on Sunday. Who has the advantage? I think it's pretty clear right now. It's Sporting Kansas City getting that away goal at Rio Tinto Stadium. Diego Rubio, the super sub, getting it done for them. Portland, Seattle is where we had next. Cascadia, what a match this was, a 2-1 win for the Timbers. Uh, as we look at what happened in this game here, Doyle, what did you make of kind of the beginnings here? Raul Ruiz Diaz doing what he does, and then the response from it, Portland. Yeah, the, the first 10, 15 minutes, it felt like Seattle was maybe going to run away with it, and Ruiz Diaz gets that goal. And instead of hitting the accelerator, they take their foot off the accelerator, and it just opened the game up for Portland. And, um, you know, when you have attackers like, like these guys, you're going to find some goals. What a yeah. day. What a day this would have been to be in the stadium. Absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, the, the good guys took home the win today. <laughs> I'm not so impartial. Uh, but, you know, credit to to the Timbers. They, they had a lethal counterattack today. And, and say what you want about Ibo Bessie, but uh, I think it's on sides. I may be biased, but either way, it was a great goal, great finish. It was very close. We will get to that in just a second, as well as a penalty shout for Christian Roldan. He wanted that one and he came out of the game. When you think about this game, Caleb, and you see kind of that lower seed taking control, what do you think? Oh, uh, Taylor Tuomo was trying to figure out even at the end who this was, yeah. which Toss result up. this favored, right? And part of it is TBD because I think that's going to be based on uh, the injuries to Chad Marshall and Christian Roldan. So we, we have to, and look, this is short rest for them too because yeah. they're playing Thursday night, which makes it tougher for them. I still think this could have gone a lot worse for Seattle. If you look at everything that went wrong, right? Look, it started off great, but then it went about as bad as you could possibly have with losing Christian Roldan and then uh, your center back, your leader, Chad Marshall, to one at halftime. To, to come away nil-nil for the second half, I thought it was a huge positive for the Sounders. Yeah. One, one nil at home, that gets them through right now. Jeremy Iwabise starting up top. This year it's been Fernando Adi. It's been Armenteros. They've moved around. They've tried to figure it out. It ends up being the young American, the 21-year-old, that gets the goal in this game that turns things around for the Portland Timbers. David Goss come with him at Providence Park after the match. Let's start with this. You get the playoff start in front of your home crowd against Seattle. Just what was this experience like for you? Yeah, it was a little bit overwhelming at first. You know, my first playoff start at home in front of our amazing fans. Sometimes it can be a lot to handle, but, you know, I, I was able to keep the nerves uh, under control, and I was lucky to get a goal in front of them. Walk me through that goal, what you saw, how it played out. Yeah, I just saw I was on opposite side of Diego Valeri, and, and as soon as he started driving with the ball, I knew that the space was in behind. From that moment, I saw Stephen Fry kind of rushing me, so... I knew the angle to goal would be a little difficult, and I had to try to get it over him, and, and that's what I was able to do. You come into this playoffs, you played confident, and assist last game, a goal here. What's Gio, what's Diego, what have the veterans, the older guys been saying to you about what you need to do? Obviously, they want me to stay grounded, but you know they're, they're pleased with what I've been doing. They, they've noticed that I've come a long way, and I feel a little bit vindicated for kind of a long year at, at times, but you know there's a long way to go for me as an individual and for our team because you know we have at least three or four more games to get to the cup what's the key for the next one maintaining our emotions it's very tough to play in seattle obviously but you know a lot of our guys are familiar with the atmosphere so i think we're going to get a good result what uh that video that goal where's that going to go is that the background to the phone <laughs> no i'm going to try to forget about it after tonight because we have to push on to new heights thanks so much for the time Jeremy Iwabise says he feels vindicated, and we'll get to that in just a second because I have the number one Jeremy Iwabise fan right here and Matt Doyle. But we got to take a look at some of these controversial calls. Of course, instant replay presented by Cheez-It. Bobby Warshaw, and I will give you your takes very, very soon, but I need this panel's thoughts. Christian Rodon, the penalty shout early on. I think it was the fifth minute. This is one that, let's just say, some of the Seattle fans in this office were up in arms about. What do we think here? There's probably some contact. There's definitely some contact with that back leg. Is this a penalty? I can't believe you're subtweeting Anders on the show. I don't think it was a penalty. Like, he, he dragged the leg. There, there's definitely a little bit of contact, but that's rolled on looking for He doesn't it. even drag the leg. He runs, the ball has passed it, but he runs straight into Atadella. Yeah. This isn't dragging the leg. This is running straight into the guy. You can't do that. You don't Rose get a City call. City glasses, Megan? Any, any differences for you here? No, 
Rosity glasses are on, but I mean, the guys are agreeing with me. It's certainly not a penalty. You can see Rodon dragging the leg. It's a big play, though, because like it, it did end up, like, it looks like that's where Rodon got hurt. And uh, I'm with Kalen, man. If Rodon can't go on Thursday, they lose a lot. It's a hip flexor for him. It's a non-ligament injury in the knee for Chad Marshall. And again, we're going to get to that. I want to see the Ebo Bise play. Go back. Show us that play, because this is one when I saw it live that I said, hold on, flag up. This is offside, to me at least. Watch him here in the middle of your screen. Ball is played. Ah, that's close, Kayla. I, I, I got to be honest with you. The first time I saw it, I, I thought it as well. But, you know, they, they've changed the rule now. So it basically says to uh, give the advantage to the attacker, at least to let the play play out. Then they go to the Which check. Is, they didn't see it. And I think it's a good goal. Yeah, and it's not clear and obvious, right? Like, the, what is it, so soccer photogrammetry yeah. on Twitter does, you know, it uses math and yeah, angles it's, and things it's that we geometry. Won't it's over yeah. my head, but like, and, and it shows like maybe, it is. yeah, maybe it's a, it's three inches offside at best. But like, that's definitely not clear and obvious. Right. Well, yeah. the one thing they can learn from this, if you're the Seattle Sounders, is if you want to play a game of in inches with Ibobise, you're gonna have trouble. And with losing Chad Marshall, in comes Roman Torres, Kim Kihi. It would be say can cause a lot of problems in the second leg if you're a, if you're a Timbers fan. That's a good tee up for uh, our number one fan over here. Jeremy, you would be say there have been some rumors that maybe they go out in the transfer market in the winter and try to upgrade. But I think you look at his trajectory and you're thinking, hey, give the kid a chance. I mean, he's played a thousand MLS minutes now. He has four goals and six assists. And it's the six assists that really define him, right? He's much more of a hold-up guy, a very unselfish player. Uh, and we saw it in the first leg, like just being strong and being balanced. And then, or not in the first leg, in the, in the knockout round game and, and setting up that Valeri goal. And um, just in terms of goal and assists per 90. But the thing is, what, we're, what we saw today is, is an evolution in his game because if you go back and you watch that clip, he starts his run early. And that was my biggest criticism uh, of Jeremy Obobese is that he's a like his runs have been a little bit too passive. He doesn't play goal hungry all the time. And if after only a thousand pro minutes, he's already adding stuff to what's already a, a pretty mature game and becoming more goal dangerous. And by the way, you don't need to win the golden boot if you're playing with Diego Valeri and Sebastian, Bla yeah. and Sebastian Blanco. You just need to do a pretty good job. I think the Timbers would be crazy to spend a DP slot on a, on a center forward to go over Jeremy Obobese when there are other places in that first 11 where they can definitely upgrade this winter. You mentioned Diego Valeri, Blanco. Those are the difference makers all year long. For a long time now, honestly, for the Timbers, Kalen, you saw off the pass on Valeri, you saw from the goal from Blanco, when you ask your big players to step up and they do, you get results like this. Well, for, for Valeri, this is nothing new. I'm sure Megan can attest to that. But Sebastian Blanco, to me, looks like a different player this year from last. He's taken a huge step forward in his development. And, and you can see it even on the goal date. First of all, Kim Kihi needs to win that tackle. I mean, you have to be able to get something. You don't get the, the ball, you have to get the man there. Because this is what happens. The ball lands. Right to Sebastian Blanco. Oh, I'm sorry, but Schmetzer, he always talks about duels one. Post Kel What's Kelvin Leardam doing here? Can I just ask that? As well, he's just trying game? to, he's scrambling at this point. <laughs> and, and look, give uh, Blanco a ton of credit because what he does here, just when you think he's about to go down or, or run out of balance or the moment has passed, he's able to have that extra little yeah. calmness in his mind to be able to cut it back across his body and finish with his left. You'd have gone down. I probably would have, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he looked a little, like a little <laughs> running back balance there. Strength. But then there's the other guy on this team that you think really bossed the game from the midfield, Diego Chara. Underrated, chronically underrated. Yeah, Chara, totally underrated. I mean, if you watch him, he's a workhorse on defense. He'll do the dirty work. He'll get the tackles in. He'll make sure he, he clogs up play. But then also, he gets forward on this play. Watch him go. <laughs> Look at him. He was uh, practically in the team. And he's beaten his forwards into the box. That's incredible. Has an unfortunate then, touch there, but he's then, like, oh crap, I had an unfortunate and touch. Then, and there he goes, <laughs> back, goes back the other way. <laughs> Camera one. I mean, there's no other player on the pitch that's putting in that amount of work. He wins the ball at the end of that. I mean, yeah. That, that's incredible. What, what an effort. I mean, there's not many players in this league that have that big of an impact on the defensive end and in the offensive third, and that's Diego, Diego Tra. All right, Portland, 2-1 winners at home in this game. Seattle with an away goal. Bobby, walk us through what's at stake here, how maybe the Sounders get back into it at CenturyLink. Yeah, the Sounders did get an away goal, but it still has to be advantage Portland. If we look here at the scenarios, a one to nothing win for Seattle means that 
Because I'm confusing myself. Seattle, with Seattle goes through. That Seattle go through. Because they got the away goal. Because they got the away goal. Thank you. I'm just testing you. It's the. <laughs> also, if Portland score, if Portland scores, then they must win by two or more goals. That's Seattle. A two to one score forces extra time. Double leg series away goals. There's math involved. It gets very confusing at times. <laughs> I don't think I don't think you helped anyone right now. I don't there. think I helped at all. I think I made it worse. Didn't you get into grad school? I I did, but. But yeah. he's here with us, and that's yeah. the important thing. Talking soccer. 2-1, it is wide open at this point. Advantage, I'm, I'm struggling to figure out who. Think, because Portland think, got the win, they got the aggregate advantage, yeah. but that away goal is so massive. Yeah, I don't think anybody's happy with this result. You know, and I, I think that um, Portland's probably a little bit more satisfied because they do have a W, but if you, you know, if you get an away goal on these things, you go back home, or, you know, Portland's not great on the road, Seattle's been really good at home. I don't, think, I don't think Seattle's crying into their pillows tonight. Maybe they are, if the news on the injury yeah. front is not good. Christian Roldan, as I said, a hip flexor issue that forced him to leave this game. Chad Marshall, non-contact, left as well. You can see Roldan not happy about this. Such a crucial part of their team, Kalen. If they lose either of these two guys for that second leg, those are big questions. Yeah, well, I, I'll be devastated personally because I picked them to an MLS Cup. So <laughs> that would be a huge blow for me. But I mean, Christian just gives them something a little bit different, right? When you talk about Chara and that and that effort and that enthusiasm that he brings to the field, that's something Christian Roldan has in his game. Yeah, you know, Ozzy Alonso has that, of course, but a little bit more central, staying in that sixth spot. And Roldan, you saw in the first goal, is able to cut and get in these little in-between pockets on the flanks, get isolated one-on-one, -on -one, and just make enough of a move to be able to square it to Rui Diaz. He's so big. And, and then Chad Marshall, I, I was relieved to see that it looks like it might not be injury da uh, ligament damage. Yeah, thank you, Floyd. Because that, that's always the greatest fear when you see a player go down, non-contact on a very routine, just sort of uh, cross-field pass. So uh, Chad Marshall, such a legend, probably MLS Defender of the Year for me this year. For him to be back in the lineup potentially this weekend, but even for the long haul, yep. it's got to be huge for Schmetzer and this team. We will follow those stories very, very closely. MLSsoccer.com is your source for all the news as we lead up the second legs. Let's reset the day a little bit, catch you back up. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you're just tired. Columbus 1-0, New York Red Bulls. No away goal in this one, just pretty back heels. And Jesse Zard is doing what he does in Columbus. Scoring goals. Justin Miram is happy about that one. This is maybe the play of the game, though. We will get into this in a second. Wow. Yeah, what? Insane. Zach Steffen. Yankee Stadium. That is a house of horrors for opponents. Just one win for away teams this year, and that was randomly the New England Revolution. There were a lot of strange plays. You think you called this a street fight? I did. I and mean, they were throwing <laughs> rocks in this one, Doyle. Yeah, they were. Uh, it was, you know, it was not pretty soccer by any stretch. Um, that one called off for a high boot. Uh, this was some pretty soccer right here. I mean, this is, I mean, again, it, it, if you can extend the field like that as a center forward, and you can do some hold-up play, um, and you come back and you, you help win the ball defensively, uh, you probably shouldn't lose your spot. You probably shouldn't lose your starting job. I see Kelvin Leardam not running to get the man there, and I'm, I'm just a little bit puzzled by that. But I'm, I'm just happy to watch this, to be witness, Megan, to some greatness there from Rusnak. And then this is so timely. Yeah, Raimondo unfortunately, you know, takes a bad deflection. And then, how about this? Rubio, third touch of the game. Ooh. Beautiful. That was a laser. He got so much power on that. I thought Nick Raimondo had a chance. He got back to his line. It wasn't to be. Here are your results from the conference semifinals. First legs, Columbus with a win. Portland with a win. Atlanta with a win. A draw in Salt Lake, but it is not a good draw for Real Salt Lake. Let's check those poll results. See who you think was the MVP for the night. All right, boom, there it is, Jeremy Ibobise. Doyle, Doyle. Yeah, influencer, magic. hashtag influencer. Yeah, that's right. why he's got his computer out here. Exactly, uh, yeah, he's that's got the right. program running. He's got all the votes up there, Doyle. Over and over and over. <laughs> Absolutely, I ran some scripts. Eric Rometty, if you had him on the props to score a goal tonight, uh, good for you. Welcome to the one club. <laughs> yeah, because right. that one. Welcome, Eric, it's good to have you, my that man. That one was uh, a little bit surprising. D-mids, Bobby Warshaw was <laughs> jacked up about mm, that. It was a beautiful night. Beautiful <laughs> no night. doubt about it. All right. Let's get to the Eastern Conference. Columbus, Red Bulls, the Supporter Shield winners, the record setters as it comes to points in the regular season with 71 were the Red Bulls. But uh, it's playoff time. So things just change for the Red Bulls, Doyle. This is... So Metro? Yeah, that, that's the line. Yeah. Uh, it, they came out really flat. And, and it you know, makes me think of uh, what Kalen was saying in the pregame show in, in terms of 
there is an advantage to, to playing the midweek game, and it's that you get bloodied in the playoffs a little bit, and you have a little momentum going into it. And um, when you have people Iguain making plays like that on top of it, uh, advantage to the crew. I, I can't even get over how shocked I was to see Iguain not in the lineup yeah. before the match. And I, I thought this was a huge gamble, a, a big risk by a burr halter in this one, and one that I, I frankly have to say I don't like. I, I genuinely don't like the idea of, of waiting, because usually that looks to looking over your shoulder with regret. We saw Tata Martino take the opposite advantage and going straight with Almiron from the beginning. I, I have to say I much prefer that, but hey, it worked. burr halter pulled all the right strings. He's the genius, and uh, Pipa Higuain comes in in the second half and completely changes the game. And. Uh, He's, that's why he's yeah. been the MVP so far. Double dose of genius. Craig Berhalter, of course, in the news so much over the last, I don't know, six months or so because of that U.S. national team link. Julian Sakovitz caught up with him at Matt Free Stadium. Let's take a listen. Coach, you say Federico Iguain for the second half. He connects with Jossie Zardes. How much of this one went to plan? It was a gamble. You know, we, we normally, um, you know, aren't that adventurous with, with decisions like that. But, um, you know, we felt it would help us win the game uh, to have him fresh in the second half. I think Patrick did a good job in the first half, and people came on and made a difference. And why are you guys able to be so successful against them? Um, listen, I think, I think we... The guys have done a great job playing against them. We know they're a very good team. I think it's a tough matchup for us and for them. So, so both ways, it's um, it's a difficult game. You see, today it was it wasn't pretty, but um, it's a playoff style game. Like two at Red Bull Arena. What's the message? Uh, we'll play our game. You know, we'll, we'll go there and, and try to do similar things that that we always do. I think it, it, right now there's no sense in changing. Thanks, coach. All right, Megan, I, I want to get this from you. You have a lot of experience at the international level. You see all these rumors with Greg Berhalter. You see this game. You see him tactically set this up. What do you make of him as a coach and this coaching performance in this match? Yeah, if you look at, at Columbus, the way that they play, they're a possession-style team. They like to, you know, be brave in the back and keep the ball. And I think that that's a, a big step that the U.S. Nash team needs to take. And, and that kind of coach with that kind of bravery and, uh, you know, helping young players develop mm -hmm. to get to that, which is what the U.S. Nash team has right now, a lot of young players. So helping them get to that kind of possession-oriented uh, side to be able to take on some of the bigger teams in the world, I think he'd be great at it. And, Megan, you talk about possession and courage. It helps to have... Uh, U.S. men's national team starter, Zach Steffen, in the back. And, and not for the reasons necessarily that you would think. You know, we saw the penalty kick saves, heroics, uh, last week. And then we, we saw, you know, the last minute save. And, and that's all incredible, right? But it's actually the numerical advantage that they get in possession playing out of the back with him because he is so comfortable with the ball at his feet. If you look at the uh, teams left in the Eastern Conference, you've got Brad Guzan and Sean Johnson. Neither of them are quite as comfortable maybe playing out of the back as Zach Steffen. So in some ways, this is actually the worst nightmare for the Red Bulls because this Columbus Crew SC team is able to play with an extra man in the back. They don't ask too much of their center backs. They drop Will Trapp in the middle. And then they have two of the best right uh, outside backs in the league yeah. with Valenzuela and Afool to be able to play out of pressure. And then worst nightmare is it actually gets to Iguain when you do get through that pressure. So I think this matchup is really tricky for the Red Bulls and, and partly because of Zach Steffen with his feet. Yeah, and if the Red Bulls come out and play the way they did... It, in the second half today, next week, this series ends pretty quick because Columbus now, they just need one at Red Bull Arena. And, and given that defense that the crew have, uh, the Red Bulls ain't getting three. All right, I want to take a closer look at the goal that Columbus scored. During these games, where we're all drinking coffee, pushing along. We sent Doyle and Bobby into the studio to break this thing down. Let's go to Anatomy of a Goal right now. It's goal line, Valenzuela threads it through the eye of the needle. Higuain, Zardes! Hey, looks up, Matt. This is Bobby, and Bobby's a very simple man who believes in very simple things, including keeping it simple when you pass the ball. Play towards who you're facing, because that's how you play through a press. Even though you've been listening all these years, Matt, that's exactly right. So many teams get scared of a press, especially Red Bulls press. But if you remain brave, if you play simple, you can actually use that press against them, because as they step to win the ball, there has to be a gap somewhere. The 11 guys can't take over the whole field. And as Arter checks over his shoulder here, he'll notice that they use their possession to suck the press in. They brought Red Bulls to where they wanted to bring them, then bang. 
turn on the half turn, switch the sides, but here's the next part of it. Once you do find that space, once you do get out of the initial pressure, you need to take advantage of it. You need to change from being a possession-oriented team to a goal-dangerous team, and that's exactly what the Crew SC do here. Yeah, this is one of the crewiest crew goals that we've seen all season. A great finish from Jossi Zardes, but that is just magic from Federico Iguain in the attacking third. A lot of fun to watch, unless you're a Red Bulls fan, because they lost 1-0 to Columbus in the first leg of the Eastern Conference semifinals. Yeah, it was 1-0, but it could have been 1-1. That's because Zach Steffen, as you said, Kaylin, came up very, very big at the end of this game. And that's really a theme we've seen with the Red Bulls in postseason's past. The almost moment. The, oh, maybe we could have moment. The, we were going to do it, but moment. This is such a huge play in this series. To deny the away goal, Megan, it, it changes everything going back to Red Bull Arena. Yeah, I think the, the Red Bulls, you know, they need to play to their strengths. So all they need to do is tweak their press a little bit. Instead of forcing them outside and letting Zach Stefan uh, split, break lines, play into the midfield, why not, you know, force them, force them wide? You see them coming in, get them outside. Don't let them play to their strengths. I think if the Red Bulls can do that and then they can get their press on the outside, they'll be in a way better spot. You see the Sporter Shield curse. I mean, they've got a bigger curse to worry about here, Doyle, and they've got a big job to do going back to Red Bull. They do. I mean, they, look, one nil, they're not, you know, there's no nails in the coffin at this point. They could turn this around if they, they go out and they play, you know, something close to their best game or just a very good game because they are a more talented team overall than Columbus are, but um, they didn't play like they believe that today. There was no point in this game where it felt like the Red Bulls were just grabbing the thing by the scruff and saying, okay, we're running this now. Uh, and, and part of that is like maybe they're just a little flat right now. And part of it is like we said in the video, like if you keep it simple and you play short pass, short pass, short pass, you can eventually break a pass, uh, press down and then hit those long diagonals and suddenly you're off to the races. Rather, at Phillips looked visibly frustrated throughout the match. They weren't able to get as much from the wings as they're accustomed to, and I think part of that was because Columbus was so good at breaking out of the press. That's usually where they're able to win the yep. balls and go forward. But, hey, look, if you're the Red Bulls, you have to say, we had a chance. We had a look at the very last you know, second of the game, Bradley Wright Phillips. You think that bounce goes your way. We've seen it hit the post and not go their way in the past, but you think uh, maybe a little bit of coming home could finally get them over that hump. Hit the post as well in a header early on. Luis Robles watching this one from back in his own net. He had some things to say after this game. Jillian Sakovitz caught up with him after the match. It's the playoffs. It's okay. We, th this isn't the worst position to be in. And, and we've been so good with our back against the wall this season. And we have a lot of experience to draw on when you look at the last couple of years and some of the big matches that we played in. So I know our group. I know that the confidence is high. And we'll go back. We'll get rested. We'll regroup. And we'll be fine for Sunday. All right, guys, let's talk about how the Red Bulls can turn this around and get the win at home and advance to the conference final. Here we see the scenarios. The Red Bulls advance if they win by at least two goals or a 1-0 win would force extra time. I don't know if they want to do extra time. I think they've seen Zach Steffen take those PKs and they're like, nah, we don't want none of that. So they'd have to expect Red Bulls are going to try to go for that two-goal lead. Problem is, all of a sudden, Columbus scores, they get the away goal. It gets hairy, then all of a sudden Red Bulls might need a third. They might need to win by more than two goals. So if you're Columbus, do you come out and try to punch Red Bulls in the mouth in the first 15 minutes? Get that goal and, and basically end the series? Ooh, there's no right answer to this. I personally would. I personally think that you always should start a game on the front foot. I think if you sit back, it makes you a little complacent. It makes you lose energy. Yes, I would always want to go into a game saying, hey, let's just go do it. Let's play our attacking style and get that goal. I think Red Bulls and Chris Armas got to find a way back to that style, and maybe that's the answer to be saying, you know, we're the aggressors. We're the best team in this league. Our press is the one that runs things that you said, Doyle. We'll see what happens at Red Bull Arena come the weekend. All right, Doyle's tweets. We follow them all night. This is one of the good ones. There's some bad ones. Oh, well, Pretty easily. Anyway. The best one of the Tata era so far, of course. Nothing pretty, but really, really rugged from the five stripes. Talking about Atlanta, a 1-0 win in New York City, in the Bronx, at Yankee Stadium. The Weeby family was there. Mama and Papa Weeby taking this one in. Great win. Incredible win. Definitely the best of uh, the Tata era, though. Yeah, no question about that. And it wasn't just that they got the win. It's that the entire first half, they were so much better than NYCFC. Like, they went out there. Uh, with real intent, and I know Joseph didn't get the goal, and that will probably have him even more fired up for the second leg, but he was really excellent the first 45 minutes. And then the second 45 minutes, they all got stuck in. They're all I mean, that's Joseph defending the, that overhead kick right there. 
Um, they all got stuck in. They all did everything they could to lock down the result. It was really rugged in a way that they haven't been. They've been a little fragile last 10 minutes of games, especially down the stretch. I, I think if you're an Atlanta fan, you have to be thrilled tonight. NYCFC, zero shots on frame for the match. Zero shots on frame. So that should tell you the story right there. I mean, uh, we, yeah, we had questioned maybe Atlanta, we know this free-flowing style, up and down play, but this was something we hadn't seen from them, to be able to show their toughness. We'd seen uh, Joseph's heroics in the box on one side, but maybe not in the other. I, I couldn't have come away more impressed by this team just by the fact that they were willing to abandon it. Even Nagby, Gressel, and Remedi in the middle. You wouldn't have think going against the likes of Ring and Herrera, some of that toughness in the middle, they stood up to the challenge. All right. Greg Garza caught up with our own uh, Julie Stewart-Binks after this match at Yankee Stadium. Let's hear what he had to say. All right, Greg, congratulations. Atlanta's first ever playoff win, and from start to finish, you guys dominated this game. How are you able to do it? It was a solid performance. I think uh, we're playing at a very difficult field uh, with a very difficult team uh, with a lot of talent on their team as well, but uh, I think we put it to them today. It's not definitely not over. We still have the, the home leg, but it feels good to get the first playoff win for Atlanta. Now, you mentioned their talent. How are you guys able to just really take care of Villa, Morales, Herrera? Uh, first of all, I'm not underestimating them at all. Uh, I think that uh, they're players that they have a hierarchy that is out of this world. You have Villa that's uh, played all over the world, but at the same time, you have to respect them as much as possible, but not give them any uh, leeway to, to really do anything. So I think we did that tonight, and uh, it, it feels really good. Really interesting. All right, the big question coming into this match was how much Miguel Almiron would play. Of course, he had some injury issues coming into it. He played 45 minutes. He made an impact. What did you see from him, Megan? Tata made a great decision here. Almiron was a game changer for Atlanta today. Everything went through him, and he just made every, everybody's level higher. I mean, he was an excellent he was excellent today on the ball. He was excellent in defense. He put in the work. It didn't even look like he had a hint of a hamstring injury. And then you go the smart route because you get the lead and you take him off. Yeah. You put him on ice. You say, we're going back to Mercedes-Benz. We don't need you for the rest of this game. Yeah, once you get that goal, you, you're pretty good. And I, I agree with you. He was he was remarkable tonight. And it's not just that you know, his obvious on the field skills, his ability to just blow past any defender with that speed of his, but he's clearly the emotional fulcrum of this team. And I think this was smart of, of Tata Martino to, to get Almiron out there from the first whistle because he was leading them. And they've kind of been lacking that the last three weeks. It was unclear who their center was. And it was absolutely clear tonight for the first 45 minutes who their center was. Absolutely. He said it perfectly. Yeah. I mean, he, he was the guy. He was the guy. And I, you, they fed off his energy. And now they have a full week of him to get healthy. And a 1-0 away goal lead on the road. I wouldn't count NYCFC out. That would be the one thing I would add just as a rejoinder because uh, they showed me a lot tonight as well. And, and I think it's going to be a different match and, and one that might actually suit them better. I think at times it was just so choppy both directions. And this is a team that when Morales gets a little bit more connected with David Villa and they can play a little bit more free-flowing style that they have something to offer as well. So I don't think the game actually suited either team. It was sort of just like an ugly uh, result of, you know, maybe the new sod yeah. or the small pitch. <laughs> <laughs> or the playoffs, but I think we're going to see a completely different match. In you know two. how many road wins uh, NYCFC have against playoff teams this year? Oh, wasn't four. That was overall. Just one. One. You know when it was? Way back when. Week one. Yep. The only two road wins under Dome, those came against Orlando City and Toronto FC. They do have the 2-2 draw in Atlanta. Julie stewart being caught up with Sean Johnson on how they can reverse the tide. Sean, a disappointing first leg for you guys. I know based on the playoff history, you wanted to come out and sort of take control of this game. How would you describe what Atlanta did well and what you want to work on heading into the second leg? Yeah, I think um, obviously um, Atlanta you know, pressed well and they were able to uh, pick up the ball in dangerous spots and uh, put us on the back foot uh, early on, I thought. I thought the second half we came out and played better. Uh, but for us, uh, I thought we you know, gained control over the second half of the game, but it was a bit too late conceding the first goal. But doing what we could to limit them from scoring again um, was the most important thing. So 1-0 uh, is obviously not ideal, but going into Atlanta, I think uh, having confidence in this group, uh, I have no doubt in my mind if we, we score a goal, we'll make it a game. NYCFC have to go to Mercedes-Benz at this point and get a win. And let's take a look at how the, how the results have to shake out for them. If they win one to nothing, it goes to extra time. If they win by any score more than one to nothing, that means they would exceed Atlanta's away goals, which is more than one, and they would automatically go through. 
any win for Atlanta obviously obviously sends them through. Guys, I actually want to talk about the, the storyline we've been discussing on this. You talk about how it was a gritty performance from Atlanta and how they really rugged out this result or whatever that rugged word is. Man. I want to flip that. Is there a possibility where actually NYCFC was a better team? They didn't get any shots on goal, but they had more chances. They got around at Atlanta's goal more often, and Atlanta just got a little lucky. Nobody's taking that. Nobody? Nobody? <laughs> Nobody? In order, in order NYCFC were the better team? In the second half, they got a lot of chances on a, on a different but soccer this is field. But this is what they've done under Dome for four months now. They go down, and then they spend the second half dominating possession and getting crappy half chances. That, and then, it, you know, you read afterwards, like, oh, yeah, they, did, they generated so many XG. Like, no, they were playing from behind for 80 minutes or however long They were long playing from behind, but they still got chances in and around the opponent's age. There was not a single chance. That's all you can ask There for. was not a single chance they generated that was like, wow, that was amazing. Well, I guess they well, had no, the, no, but they got the one, the, the Burgett one. No, no, no. A they got to the spots. They got to those zones on each side of the 18 or the top of the box, and they just didn't put the right ball in. Right, but, you would take a good team. But, Bobby, they took out Miguel Almiron, their top player at halftime. They put in uh, a hobbled... Uh, Vialba for the second half to help weather the storm and they're playing at home so of course they're gonna push the game late and they, they needed to they were down a goal so they throw everything forward and Atlanta United with the numbers they had just tried to attack with two and hold up Chanel was great and to be able to you know they couldn't really get a, a, an exit valve they had the one chance with Martinez but you'd expect NYCFC they're a good team to be able to push forward in the second half but in the first half when it really mattered Atlanta United was the aggressive team I thought they had the much better of the play in the first half with Miguel Miron and that's the team they're going to face next weekend. Megan, you said in our pregame show, and it generated a little bit of uh, controversy among Atlanta United supporters, that they need to win MLS Cup. What did you see in this performance that reflects some of that pressure that you were talking about? Oh, I loved it. Atlanta United, I mean, they were gritty on a field that is too small, <laughs> that was overlaid with, with grass that kept, that kept coming spongy. up. Yeah, spongy. And, and when you play as a player, when you play on something like that, it's very slow and, and you slip a lot. So, and it was on the road. I mean, they have all of these factors going against them and they were still able to pull together this performance and get that win. And now they get to go home and play in front of their home crowd, 70,000 fans, and just enjoy that experience because they can play their best soccer there and go through. Think about the comparison here. Decision day, they need a win. They lose big time in Toronto. They don't respond to the pressure. First game in the playoffs, the biggest game in, in club history. They get a big victory in New York City. Just the second team to do that this year. Let's take a look at those MVP results we've been pushing on Twitter tonight. See who you're going with. We don't, I'm not going to guess that Eric Rometty is going to get this one. We're still Jeremy Obobese, TID. Well done. Well done to the Eric Rometty deserves some love, though, because he's been a completely nondescript D-mid since he came into the league. Don't you dare say that about D-mid. Bobby Warshaw's right over there. Uh, Bobby's I can give an honorable mention to Parkhurst, who somehow managed to get through this match with zero fouls <laughs> and zero shots. <laughs> so that's impressive. And, you know, him and Lorenowitz, I think, are two guys that uh, maybe unsung heroes on this team at time, but with the experience they've played in pretty much every MLS playoff match known to man. 2006 Revs represent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, we're they were huge. towards something we're all familiar with, which is going to be Columbus and Atlanta maybe in the playoffs. We'll see what happens in leg two. We asked for your questions. Juan Herrera says, which team is going to be in the most trouble heading into the second leg at home? His pick is the Red Bulls. Anybody disagree? Agree? Who's in the most trouble? Seattle. Seattle's in the most Seattle trouble Seattle down a goal. And Portland's better on the road. The way Portland plays, when they can sit deep and hit you on the counter, Seattle has the onus on them down a goal and at home. This suits Portland perfectly. Also, we, we really didn't talk about it, at least not enough in my opinion. Chad Marshall possibly being out for this match. I know it's not ligament damage, but he had to be removed non-contact. If they don't have their very best defender, maybe their best player, that is a huge, huge loss for Brian Schmetzer and the Sounders. Anybody else? We got Seattle from Bobby. He thinks it's the Red Bulls. No. I think, I mean, it's it's one of those two teams. I think I would rather be in Seattle's shoes because they have the away goal. Yeah. Uh, the Red Bulls, I mean, again, razor thin margins. If you give up one to Columbus, you got to score three. That's tough. That is very tough. Kyle Killian, hot takes. Sporting KC's lack of possession and apparent attack was a real, was a real so Sestinovic, excuse me, his suspension, you'll see a different attacking team next Sunday. Jan Quaze is a DP attacker. He played left back. What do you think about that? No, I, I disagree. I mean, I, I think Sestinovic. 
uh, coming back. I think they were able to dodge a bullet, frankly, without him going yeah. against Savarino. He'll be able to neutralize them defensively, but the team looked good defensively. Sporting is always organized. They, they didn't give up much other than, you know, a, a really a world-class goal. It was really the more the, the, the movement from defense to attack that was a problem. Johnny Russell was good. And look, we talked about it with the effort and the enthusiasm. Shallowy didn't have his touch uh, tonight, but he did make pressure on the goal. And, and that's why he didn't get subbed off the match. That's why he's in the team. And that's sometimes the way it goes on the road. All right, let's move on to the next one here. See what else you got from our Twitter followers out there uh, from Senior Fern. Any chance of a repeat of 2015 MLS Cup? Portland against Columbus. What do you think about that? That was a good day for folks from Portland, Megan. I mean, anything can happen in MLS playoffs. Come on. That's why we have MLS playoffs. Yeah, after like all of our one. predictions in the, uh, yeah. uh, the show here, I don't know if we want to be talking about That was hours ago, Weeby. Come on. <laughs> it was like 10 hours ago. That was a lifetime ago. Yeah. I've, I've done all sorts of things in the meantime. All right. Let's end it here in the way that we often do. Our favorite goals of the day, the highlights that everybody is looking for. Megan, I'm going to let you start. What did you see? What's your goal today? My goal today has to be Portland. I got my Rose City glasses on, of course. A Boba say. Like, do you play for Portland? I didn't notice that. I, yes, I actually do. I don't know if you can tell, but I mean, the individual skill from from three players here, Char finding finding Valeri. Outside and, the boot. Woo. Yeah, and the texture that he puts on it is world class. And then you have to give a lot of credit to a Boba City here. He looks up, he chips the goalkeeper, finds a side netting. That's hard for a veteran player. I mean, and he's a young player. Yeah. I mean, he's got so much upside potential. Vindication, he says, Kalen, this is you. Yeah, Jossie Zardes, but uh, I'll probably end up talking Iguain. You know when you sometimes you have a feeling that someone might be behind you, and you just kind of feel like, is there someone creeping up behind me? Pipa knows. <laughs> Pipa knows. Nobody creeps up on Pipa. <laughs> Pipa knows what's going on every which way around him. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the pace on it, the weight of the touch, the trajectory, the angle, makes it so easy for Zardes. A beautiful finish. Kind of looks like a ballerina there. Are we going to create that? Pipa knows t shirt That should be a hashtag, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, so I love this one because, like, literally in the 10 seconds leading up to this goal, was sitting next to Bobby Warshaw, and he was announcing to the room, what's really different about Sporting Kansas City this year is that they can't really press anymore. They can't create goals out of the press. And like 10 seconds later, <laughs> 10 seconds later, they pressed their way to an equalizing right, right, goal. This is so a true story. It was so what's good. Oh, the mid union. On. The mid union. <laughs> yes, today we had a defensive midfielder join the one club. What more could we want? A banger too. Look at <laughs> yeah. look at him. This is the kind of all of defensive midfielders. Boom. Not, there's a rule when a defensive midfielder joins the one club, it can't be for more than three yards. I love how he hit the post from right <laughs> yeah, there. How is that even possible? Yeah. How did he hit the post yeah. from here? That's double XG Impressive. right there. Boom. I think it's counted twice. Where, where do defensive midfielders go for their nightcaps after joining the the oh, one club? We can't tell you that unless you're in the club. <laughs> hold on, hold on. There's a defensive midfielder on this play, but he's playing number nine. Samir Krylog, look at this little cushion header. That's nice. I like this. I like to build up a little dink from Rusnak. Yeah, cushion header. Bam! Wow. They're going to miss him so much in Kansas City. Albert Rusnak with a late tackle. It'll keep him out of the second leg, but nothing can keep this out of the back of the net. Tim Melia has incredible reflexes. He gets nowhere near that one. I'm just heartbroken that my guy Albert cut the hair. We had the matching hair. I can't. Come on, man. Just keep it for the playoffs. That would have been really good. All right. Let's uh, talk about the uh, next games coming up Sunday and Thursday. Seattle, Portland on Thursday, 1030 p.m. Eastern. Audi MLS Playoffs Central is here with the pregame and postgame show for all of this. So come on Thursday. We will have the breakdown here. We'll also uh, be there on Sunday pregame before Sporting Kansas City, Real Salt Lake, Atlanta, NYCFC, New York Red Bulls, Columbus. We will find out who are in the conference championships. From there, it's just one step. One step to MLS Cup on December 8th. That's what this is all leading up to. The Philip F. Anschutz Trophy is the ultimate prize, and we are just getting started. All right, I think that's it, guys. It's time to go home, go to bed. Thank you for watching. Thank you for you hanging out with us for 10 hours today. Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern. That's the next time you will see us. In the meantime, have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Megan Klingenberg, Kaylin Carr, Matt Doyle, Bobby Warshaw. Look at that hair. And Nico Ladero's hair. <laughs> Will that move on to the conference championships? Uh, I don't know. We'll find out on Thursday. We'll see you then, everybody. I'm going to dye that rave green.